wisdom, used 234 times in 222 verses of the Bible. The skill of understanding the reality of the world and the spirits that drive it. If Jesus Messiah can walk on the water, then why did he need Peter's boat? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembert. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study. As we go through the Bible in one year, it's a good question, isn't it? It is. You might ask the question, if he's walking on water, why did he get in the boat? Uh, that's a really good question. We're going to be talking about the answers to those questions and more coming up in a moment as we focus on the Gentile physician's gospel. His name is Luke. And he writes to the Gentiles, to the Greeks, and physician Luke isolates a scene in which Peter's boat is used, and I call this the fisherman's call. Very interesting uh, discovery today in Luke, so stay with us as we continue. Corey is also here to tell us what's coming up later in Bible archaeology and history. The history on today's program is all about the fishing village of Capernaum. Yes, Capernaum actually means the village of Nahum. Did you know that? It's an amazing place. And Corey and I have been there. It's awesome. Anyway, uh, do you know? Yes. Do you know how long Simon Peter, James and John had been fishing before Jesus told them to launch out again with their nets? So does he answer that question by saying, Lord, we've yeah. been here, and I won't finish mm -hmm. it. But Don't finish it. I won't finish it. Okay. All right. So that's a good question. That and more is coming your way. Stay there. Quick study continues. <laughs> program, you and I are going to take a look at different aspects of the village of Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is where the Bible tells us that the disciple Peter actually had a home. And here in Capernaum is the site of quite a few miracles and quite a few very famous sermons by Jesus within the synagogue. Right now, in this first segment, you and I are going to explore some of the history and a lot of the archaeology of this village where Jesus spent a lot of time. Ancient Capernaum was abandoned for almost a thousand years before being rediscovered in the 1860s. The town is called Capernaum, Kfarnahum, or Talham. All three of these names mean the village of Nahum and may preserve a tradition that the biblical prophet Nahum was born here. Capernaum is famous for its use by Jesus as a home base for his ministry. According to the Gospels, this is where Peter and Andrew lived, Matthew worked as a tax collector, and Jesus stayed, taught, and healed many. As a result of this history, a large section of Capernaum was bought by Franciscan monks and another by the Greek Orthodox Church, both of whom have conducted extensive excavations since 1905. Capernaum was an important fishing village on the Sea of Galilee. A man-made, eight-foot-tall seawall stretched along the coast, out from which many stone piers were built to provide docking space for fishermen and to be used for commerce and potentially taxation. Capernaum was a border village between the territories of Herod Antipas and his brother Philip. As such, fishermen bringing catch across the border may have had to pay duty here. In 1986, a drought lowered the waters of the Sea of Galilee and uncovered an abandoned ancient fishing boat just three miles from Capernaum. This boat would have been manned by five men and gives insight into the fishing styles of the disciples. 
Capernaum was also close to an international trading route and was important enough to have a stationed Roman centurion, according to Luke 7, and verified by the remains of a Roman bath. This centurion is also claimed to have built a synagogue in Capernaum, the remains of which still exist underneath a later synagogue. As a town, Capernaum was occupied from the 5th century BC to the 11th century AD when it was finally abandoned, and now stands for us as a testimony to the past. It is time to explore the wise guys of the Bible, and they are all around us. Our reading today is Luke chapter 4 through 6, and in it we find something interesting. The good news. The good news of God's provision for the fallen is not, nor has it ever been hidden. Luke shows us the fulfillment of Psalm chapter 110, verse 3 in chapter 5. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of your holiness, referring to Messiah. Now, this prophecy is fulfilled as Peter, Andrew, and the sons of Zebedee leave all that they have acquired and they volunteer freely to follow Jesus Messiah. Jesus Christ commandeered Peter's boat to preach. He had a higher reason. Our Lord could have simply walked out on the water, but he chose to use Peter's passions and Peter's possessions to volunteer his future as a fisher of men. I call it the fisherman's call. Luke 5, 1 through 11. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Rod Hembry here. This is Quick Study. Thank you for staying with us. The Gospel of Luke is amazing. Now, Luke is a Greek physician. Now, that means that he's going to see the life of Jesus Christ a little bit differently than maybe our Jewish apostles see it. Luke, of course, being a physician, is going to record some interesting details. Also remember that Luke and Acts are written by the same person, and many scholars believe, and there's a lot of credence to this, that the book of Acts and the book of Luke were written for Paul's defense at Rome. So the details become important. This is an interesting passage. Now, today, I want to talk about this scene. I call this the fisherman's call. This is a great scene, one of my favorite in the whole Bible. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 reads this way. 
So it was as the multitude pressed about him, that is Jesus, to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. Now, the, or Gen Gennesaret. now this particular name is the Gentile name for identified from the other side. Verse two. And he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them. The boats were unattended and were washing their nets. And then he got into one of the boats which was Simon's boat. And he asked Simon to put out a little from the land. And so he sat down in the boat and he taught the multitudes from the boat. Now, I cannot leave this alone. We have to come back and look at this scene. So here you have Simon Peter. Now, we're going to learn the kind of personality that Simon Peter is. Here's Simon Peter. He's a fisherman. He's already ticked off because economy is not very well and a fish are not very many. And uh, so he's sitting in his boat and here comes Jesus and Jesus kind of invades his boat, steps into his boat. Well, that's kind of different. And then Jesus says, okay, push out. So here's Simon. Okay. And we have pictures of this from the other gospel. So he pushes out and, and here's Peter sitting in the boat with Jesus, sitting in a boat with Jesus. And they're not fishing for fish. They're teaching the word of God. They're fishing for men. Here is the first one. The call of God on our lives is not activated until we willingly say yes. Peter's boat became the Lord's platform. You see, Peter said, all right, I'll push out. You can use my boat. Whenever you say, okay, God, you can use my boat. Well, you're on the way. <laughs> That's the beginning of your call. A lot of people ask me, well, Rod, I'm trying to discover, you know, the call of God on my life. But the good news is, beloved, that the call of God on your life comes into your life as you're working and say yes to him where you are with what you have. Just say yes to him where you are with what you have, whatever he calls you to do, to be that person who helps your fellow worker wherever you're working right now and watch what the Lord does. Look at verse four. When he had stopped speaking, Jesus said to Simon, now he begins, he's speaking to the audience. Now he's speaking directly to Peter. He says, launch out into the deep and let down your net for the catch. What a line, what a line. Jesus says, launch out into the deep and let down your net for the catch. Some of you watching today, that's what Jesus is saying to you. Verse five, but Simon Peter answered the master Jesus and said, master, we have toiled all night and we've caught absolutely nothing. But nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. What a statement. You see, beloved, the important thing to remember as we focus on this particular scene before we get to the point is that Jesus gives us a command and it may not make sense. It may make absolutely no sense and there may be 55 different ways why it doesn't make sense. But if we say yes and we say it this way, okay, Lord, if you said it, I'll do it. I don't think it's going to work very well. I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, we tried this before. A hundred times we tried this before. But because you said it, we'll do it. And what Peter was saying was, I'll do it out of honor and respect for who you are. Here's the point. The call of God requires steady, determined obedience, even if that obedience seems pointless. I love that. Now then, let's go to verse six. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish so that their net was breaking. This tickles me because it's just, it's just the opposite. I can see Peter's face. Verse seven. So they signaled, you know, to the other partners uh, in the other boat to come on, get out here and help us. And they came and they filled both boats. So they began to even sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, Simon Peter fell down at Jesus' knees saying, O oh Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. See, Peter knew who he was, but so did God. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And also were James and John, these are the sons of Zebedee, who were the partners with Simon. But Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, Simon. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and they followed him. Now, before we get to the point, I want to tell you something. Look at this scene again. 
Peter sees that there's something supernatural going on because Peter knew the water. He knew the lake. He knew the trends of the fish. He knew all of the natural things that happened. But then Peter with Jesus in his boat senses a supernatural thing happening that all the norms were off because Jesus was in. Now the second thing that comes to Peter is I don't deserve this. Such favor and such power. The kind of man I am, I don't deserve this. But you know what Jesus does? He completely ignores that idea. And he says, you know what, Peter? I'm going to call you. Yes, you don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway because I love you. So, beloved, remember, <laughs> there's a lot of things we don't deserve, but Jesus gives it to us anyway because we love him. Here's the last point, and we'll put it on the screen. The call of God changes our lives. We move from meaninglessness to powerful purpose as we learn to obey God. And by the way, that is an acquired skill. Just so you know, obeying God doesn't come natural. <laughs> it's an acquired skill. That's something I've learned after, you know, 52 years on the planet. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, 35 of them following Jesus. To obey God is an acquired spiritual skill. But when you do it, when we do it, beloved, I mean to tell you, our lives just change. Everything God has given me, I don't deserve, but he's given me because he loves me. The teaching material on today's program is in print form in our Bible guide. Write for yours today. The address is coming up later. in the program, you and I took a look over uh, as like an overall view of the village of Capernaum where Jesus had one of his home bases of ministry uh, during his three, roughly three years of ministry here on the earth. Now we are going to today, right now, focus in specifically on a smaller area of this village, a very significant one uh, in the religious life of Capernaum, and that is the synagogue. Now uh, I hope you'll find it as fascinating as I do as we look at the layout and the purpose of this synagogue here in Capernaum. The fishing town of Capernaum was home to Peter, the disciple of Jesus. It seems to have served as a sort of home base for the ministry of Jesus in Galilee. Today, tourists, scholars, and lay people can visit the ruins and see the basalt stone houses that surely witnessed the works and teachings of Jesus Christ. The white limestone synagogue that stands today was most likely built in the third or fourth centuries AD. However, it was built on top of the basalt synagogue of Jesus's day, maintaining the shape and probably the layout as well. That basalt foundation visible today probably reverberated the very sound of Jesus's voice saying, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Recorded in John chapter six. The synagogue was rediscovered officially in 1852, but thorough excavation didn't begin until 1905. It lasted for just over 20 years. Long, painstaking work has resulted in one of the most interesting, visited, and loved sites in Israel. The most dangerous threat to the world today is the casual Christian. Join Rod Hembry on his latest video working directly from the scriptures to discover the truth about our present times and the spiritual warfare in it. Discover why the present day church in the West is weak and how to change it. This DVD also comes with a second provocative presentation titled, Who is Satan? Discover the real enemy in this world behind the wars, crime, sickness, disease, death, and starvation. Both presentations, The Dangerous Casual Christian and Who is Satan, are expository teaching directly from the scripture. And for a suggested donation of $25 or more, we will send it to you. 
Write today and receive your DVD. Write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. This is Quick Study. We're rolling on through the New Testament and it is exciting. Now on the next program, we're going to be focused on Luke chapter seven through nine, where we will be talking about too hungry to eat. Now, can you imagine being too hungry to eat? But then Jesus steps in and we're going to figure out what happens over there. It's going to be a really interesting, a really interesting thing. They did not have a local Walmart or, or, or a local, mm -mm. what do you call it? Uh, Castle Burger or a Five Guys and a Hamburger out there in the middle of the Middle of the, by the way, Five Guys and a Hamburger is really good, but that's Five another story. Five Guys and a Burger. Five Guys and a Burger, yeah. And fries. Yeah, and hello to Cliff, my good buddy who works there in Murraysville. Uh, yeah, we met him one we night. We met Cliff at Five Guys and a Burger, yes. Mm -hmm. We love you, Cliff. Anyway, keep studying the Bible, Cliff. Anyway, uh, so that's a totally different topic. Way off that's topic. That's tomorrow. Let's get back to today. We'll bring what, it back. What is today's we'll Do You back. Know? Do you know how long Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John had been fishing before Jesus told them to launch out again with their nets? How long, Corey? I'm pretty sure that the answer is all night. They had been fishing all night without success. Yeah. See, She's see, right. all she night was long. overthinking it. She was thinking hours that I had asked. Yeah, hours. she was like, oh Scripture no. Scripture doesn't say that actually. Luke 5 5 says, But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. But here's the scoop. Nevertheless, I love this, at your word. I will let down the net. And so some people might think, well, why would they be fishing all night long at nighttime? But this was a very common practice um, in those times. A lot of times the fishermen would take out torches with them and the light from their torches would attract, allure the fish to come around the boat. So there's a lot of good thinking and in night fishing, but it didn't work for them that night. You do a little research on the, on the history of Rome and the economy at that time was not good. No. Uh, many of the emperors, not the least of which Tiberius, was actually depleting the, the resources of the other surrounding uh, nations that had been, that Rome had subjugated. And they were using them for all kinds of different decadent exploits. And, mm -hmm. and so really, the, the, really it was terrible. I mean, the economy was terrible, so they're mm -hmm. desperate as well. And they're at the end of it. And it seems as if God brought these men to the end of it only to give them a new vision. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that uh, their toil was for much different reasons. But what's interesting to me is, you know, they were with Jesus when he fed the 5,000. They were with Jesus when he fed the 4,000. Mm -hmm. And put yourself for a minute in their mindset. They fish for a living. That's what they did. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, well, feed the people. And they're like, well, with what? You know, Andrew's like, well, we, we, we got a couple thing. of fish, but what is that what to is this, that? you know? And uh, you have so many more mouths and you have a few little fish. He said, well, take them, get, bring it here. He blessed it. And he said, now just start passing mm -hmm. it out. So the disciples get up and they're passing it out. And every time they reach in, there's more coming out, you know? It's, it's like, it just doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you see any big flashes of lightning or it just continues to come. Yeah. And oftentimes Jesus has miracles in our lives where we just continue. It does not appear that we have everything we need, but as we in faith take the steps that Jesus Christ gives us, mm -hmm. the things we need come. That has been the story of this ministry for the indeed. last 24 years. It has indeed. We do not have vast amounts of money. We live on cash flow. We have no real facilities from the bank. And so we live basically on the daily offerings that come from our partners. And I want to say thank you to our partners who I call you the Quick Study Support Team. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being faithful to God. For in doing so, your support of this ministry, whether on radio or television, keeps us here each <laughs> and every day. And we're able to teach the Word. And I, I hope that we're trying really hard to be a blessing. 
and I hope that we are. And if you ever want to see us, you can just come to Orangeville. You might not want to come in the winter, but you can come to Orangeville. We're just up the street from Brampton and not too far from Toronto. And uh, come on Highway 410 North and go 10 North and make hang a left at Broadway. We're 219 Broadway and Sundays. Services are at 9 and 10 or 9 and 11 and also services Sunday night. So come and see us. And thank you partners for helping us to stay on the air each and every day right here. You know, many believers struggle with the call of God upon their lives. They overthink and agonize too much. Like Peter and other disciples, the call of God comes where we are with what we have. God's wisdom is at work in us when we learn that we are called to let God transform our lives right in our own workplace. His desire is that we do our work for His excellence, even if the work seems boring or unchallenging. If we focus on God's call to become obedient witnesses in our work, we become challenged. With that, we pray, Lord, help me to see the power position that you have put me in as your witness right in my own workplace. In our Wise Up segment today, we continue to study the book of Proverbs. What a great book it is. Now, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 6 says this, Getting treasures by a lying tongue is the fleeting fantasy of those who seek death. Wow, what a powerful statement that is. Getting treasures by lying about it or pretending to be somebody you're not and then, and then seeking that is just the same as seeking death. That to me is amazing. But God says seek life. As a matter of fact, when the women were looking for the body of Christ, he had risen from the dead and, and he said, why are you seeking the living from the dead? Yet many people in today's world are seeking the purpose for life in the decadence of today. Have a blast while you last. There's a higher purpose than this life. There's a bigger, bigger lifespan than 70, 80, 90 years. There's eternity. And what are you gonna do in eternity? Jesus said that if you come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He will give you a forever with him that is amazing. Come to Jesus today. Seek him and his word. Thank you for joining us today, radio listeners. Our address is P.O. Box 150, Marysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2.